Shalom and welcome to another edition of our Daily Bread. I'm Messianic Torah. And this week's parasha is the fourth parasha of the book of Shemot, also called Exodus. And it's called Beshalach, which means when he sent. And in this week's parasha, it starts back in Exodus or Shemot 1317 through 1716 with the half Torah in Judges or Shoftim 44 through 531. And my message for 2017-18 is called when they see war. So in this week's parasha, we start off with this phrase that it says, and it came to pass when Paro had let the people go, that Elohim led them not through the way um, of the land of the Pelishtim, right? Although it was near for Elohim said, less peradventure, the people repent when they see war. And this message um, is, is really going to start off with this this two types of repentance, right? It says, unless the people repent, right? Which is to turn around and to go back, um, to return. Now this brings us to the two types of repentance. We've all heard about repentance in the gospel. We've heard about this idea of teshuva um, and, and returning back and turning back away from basically a 180 degree turn. Now, the problem is, is there's really two types of repentance. There's the good type of repentance when you're going towards sin and you turn back and go back the other way. And then there's the negative repentance, which is you're going the right way and you turn back to wickedness. And in this case, they would be going from following Yodewahe to turning back to Mitzrayim. Now, it's important to understand that because I think that there's this is a key problem. You could see both sides of this in the Torah consistently, right? You can see this on the side of Israel constantly sinning, mankind being wicked, and those who will do righteousness right, those who will who will turn away from the ways of the world, who will be uncommon, and and they'll go out there and do what's right. That's great. And then as we see in Ezekiel, you know, there's the story of the person who was wicked who turned to righteousness. And this really gives us this duality as well. And then it also talks about the one who was righteous who then turned to wickedness and how it was worse for them. Now, these two types of repentance are important because they really illustrate the two types of people, right? That there are. There's the, the type of people who are you know, working on observing the Torah, and even if they slip to wickedness, you know, they're going to repent, they're going to go back, they're going to turn back towards Torah. The idea of scatter, scattered Israel is really about those who've been lost, just like the prodigal son. They've squandered away their inheritance, and then eventually they're going to turn back to the Torah, and that's part of the regathering, a very important um, event uh, in the Bible, and, and you know, if if people follow that, you know, that process and, and that story from the Old Testament, and uh, you know, the the Book of Hoshea and and Amos, you're going to come into this situation where you're going to understand the New Testament even better, because you're going to be able to understand what it's talking about when it says, "Go not to the nations." but go unto the lost sheep of, of the house of Israel. you know. And then when he also says, go preach the gospel, which is to repent, to return, right? For the kingdom is near. If you were never at the kingdom, right? If, if you never kept the Torah, how would you repent from it? You know, for the people who, you know, modern, a lot of modern Christian teaching, you know, they see these verses, but I think, that in many ways they haven't really understood what the word repent means. And you're either repenting, which is to turn away from the Torah, to sin, which is a violation of the Torah, or you're turning away from a violation to the Torah back to obeying the Torah, right? These are the fundamental two things, the two types of repentance, the two types of people that there are out there. So the problem is, is that a lot of times in 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 many um, Christian teachings that the law is done away with that you know that was for the Jews or the dispensationalism that that was just for a time you know and, and oh well that was just to show us we couldn't do it all these kind of things right the problem is is 
what they're ultimately teaching is to go away from the Torah, right? And and a violation of the Torah, whether it's not keeping Shabbat or not eating kosher or whatever it is, um, is is a turning away. Especially if you're saying, well, I'm following God or I'm following the Messiah, but I'm going to turn away from the Torah. Um, there's many verses, of course, that say that you know people who who who, who do that they, they you know they're liars and, and there's no uh, light in them, right? And the people who say you know they believe but they don't keep the law, or the people who say they love you know him and, and don't keep the Torah. Um, these are all verses in the New Testament. So for me, it is, it's really about just understanding. Even if a person says, hey, all I believe in is the New Testament, then cool, then read your New Testament and understand you have to make all the pieces fit. Um, many people run to some confusing verses in Paul, some very deep kind of theological arguments about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. They're not too deep to comprehend if you actually knew the Torah in advance and then read those, you'd come to a different conclusion. And it's the same way with the gospel. It's the same way with repentance. If you understand what repentance is, you understand the function of repentance, then in order to do as both John the Baptist and Messiah were teaching when it says to repent, that was the main message of the gospel, for the kingdom is near. Um, this idea to return is a return to Torah, right? The only other thing a person could get out of that is to repent from doing good, turn away from observing the law. If that's the case, there's only two types of people. You know, there's the parable of the wheat and the tares. There's the children of the devil, right? Even the people who came to him and said, we're of our father Avraham. We, you know, we're the seed of Avraham. He says, if you were of Avraham's seed, you would have Avraham's works, right? The works were the works of the law. He said, you're of your father, the devil, right? The devil is the one who teaches to break God's commandments. Same as the serpent did in the very beginning. Um, you know, God gave his commandments to his children. And then a serpent came along and said, surely you won't die. So first, knocks out the fact that there won't be a punishment. Number two... Actually, they, he tries to say it was actually God's plan. God knew when you ate it, you know, you, your eyes would be opened, you'd be like him. As if that was the plan. Which then again goes right along with that narrative that, oh, you know, the, 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 the law was there just to, to show us that, you know, to bring us to this point to where we'd realize that we can't keep it. And that it was okay to break the commandment. It's not a good teaching. Um, and it's a misunderstanding of the verses in the New Testament as well. So, but that's the problem. You know, even God's children, who he brought out of Mitzrayim, he knew that they might return back to wickedness. Even though they cried out, they wanted help, and he heard their cry and came to them when they were in hard bondage. But the reality was, not very long after that, they're ready to go back and act like it was so good there when it wasn't good for them. And this is the problem. These are the two types of repentance. People turning back. When you turn back, you're also turning literally your back to, to where you are. So if you're doing sin and you repent and you turn back and go the way, you're turning your back on that sin. You want nothing to do with it, you're going to go back the other way. If you were at righteousness and you turn your back to that and go towards sin right then you're turning your back on the law on the torah on obedience and you're moving towards a violation of the law these are the two types of repentance and it's important to understand that and break it down because no matter how a person wants to say oh well what about this verse and what about that and they want to twist it and do it you look at the fruit what is the net result are you trying to teach me we should obey more or obey less. Because that was the argument that was happening with the serpent in the garden. That was the first lie of the Bible, right? That somehow we were meant not to keep the law. Somehow we're going to be rewarded and be like God. 
uh, and not die and get any punishments if we, if we break the law, right? It's still a common teaching. You see it in Christianity. You see it even among many Messianics who came out of Christianity um, because ultimately those people are not for the law, right? You know, King David, King David, he meditated and he said, it's not a burden, it's my delight. He loved the law, right? And he was a very important person in, in the scriptures. We see that there's the people who, who love, you know, Messiah was called the living word of God, right? He was the living law. He's also called the spirit of the law. doesn't mean the law is done away with. If he's the spirit of the law, the very essence of the law, and you try and do away with the law, then those people are also saying they want to do away with Messiah, right? And even in Messiah's time when he walked the earth, there were the people who were trying to kill him and wanted to see him removed because he was the law, right, the living law. And there was those people who were learning from him and even difficult teachings. Um, they were trying to follow the law, right? This is the story of his disciples and his followers. They're literally following the living word of God. The living word of God at that point, there's no New Testament. You know, it's not going to be written for a long, long time till after that. So when it says that he was the word of God made flesh, the word of God back then would have been what most people call the Old Testament, um, which includes the Torah, the, the, the first five books, and then uh, the prophets and the writings. So... When someone's like, hey, he's the living word of God, the very nature of the fact that he was perfect according to what? According to the, the Torah, according to the laws. He, he didn't have sin, right? All these things used to describe him in the New Testament. you got to get the context of it. What does it mean he didn't have sin? What's defined as sin? Breaking of the Torah. Even the New Testament defines it that way. A transgression sin is the transgression of the law. Therefore, if he didn't have sin, he was never a transgressor of the law. So a lot of people, they even try and say, oh, look, here, he actually, they believe that he broke the law. Well, a couple things. If he broke the law, then, then you've got contradictions in the New Testament. Then he's not perfect. Then he's not the perfect sacrifice for you. You know, everything crumbles if he's not perfect. And the measure of perfectness, of perfection, is total obedience to the law. I mean, just, just listen to what that means. The measure of perfection is total obedience to the law. That's what Messiah is. If you say you're his follower, you're his disciple, then you would be someone who believed in total obedience to the law. I mean, it's that simple. You can't come with anything else and say you're his follower. You can't come with anything else and say you're his disciple. His disciples were people who were interested in total obedience to the law. And those who wanted to kill him right even some people say oh the pharisees they were do they were the total keepers of the law no they weren't they were keeping their religion they built a religion that had a different set of interpretations and rules that actually caused them to not obey the law but because there was a uh, you know common teaching and everyone accepted it and there was a majority rules even though it had changed the word of God and Messiah came and he corrected that and he brought people back to the truth in the Torah and the actual law so so people who now 2,000 years later are creating religions or following religions that, that spawned out of that you know that have nothing to do with the law no interest in the law they're no different they're, they're all the same. There's two sides. You're either for the law or you're against it. You're either for Messiah or you're against him. You're either for the word of God or you're against it. You're either in obedience or disobedience and transgression. You know, the whole idea of, you know, here's the one who, who, who you know, died, you know, and, and is removing sin. How do you remove sin? You teach obedience. That's how you remove sin. Right? If somebody's not keeping the Shabbat, and you teach them to keep the Shabbat, which is what the Torah does, the living word of God does, it tells you these rules, here's how you do it. Then you take one from this side, right? 
of breaking the law, breaking, transgressing the law, and you put them back over here to keeping the law. Whether you've never heard the law, or whether you heard the law and you started violating it, or whether you were like the Pharisees that over years and years you made up all these laws to where, you know, you started off attempting to keep the law and then you added to it and added to it and bended and twisted the words, you know, and then finally God sends a messenger, right, his son, to come back and correct people and get people right back on the path because they'd strayed off the path, right? That's why it says you've, you've made for commandments the traditions of men, right? They're not actually the commandments. Those are just the traditions that they'd gotten passed on to them and that they've added to. And that's the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Pharisees is the problem, not the loaf. The bread, the dough, was fine before it became puffed up into something it wasn't. That's the unleavened bread, the pure truth, right? And this is what happens. We get a hold of things and we mess it up. So these are the two types of repentance that you see here. So this idea that when they see war, they might turn back, right? When they see that it gets difficult, they might turn back to what? Turn back to their captors. Turn back to wickedness. Turn back to Mitzrayim. Egypt means oppression, right? It's sin that oppresses us because it doesn't produce good fruit in our lives. Right? And so this is the important thing is that we have to come back and we have to make sure from what things are we turning away from and what are we turning to. Right? That's a very important thing that you have to do because you're going one direction or another. So the next thing is we're going to talk about commitment and faithfulness. So as we dig into this week's parasha, we see this idea over and over again. They, they get to, to the other side, right? They were afraid, then they get to the other side, and then God fights for them, right? And then they start complaining, right? They're not very committed, and they're even talking about Mitzrayim as if it was a good thing, right? You know, did you bring us out here to kill us, right? And they're now comparing and thinking, oh, maybe it'd be better if they were back there. Well, you have to make a commitment, right? And that's only one part. When they came out of Mitzrayim, they made a commitment, right? They said they put the blood on the doorpost, and they said, okay, you know, we have a choice to make. Either stay here with Paro or leave with Moshe. And they chose to leave with Moshe and go out and follow God. Now, the problem is, from that point on, what's being tested is their faithfulness. Every time they complain, every time they think they want to go back, all this and that, they already made the commitment. But they're not being faithful to their commitment. And this goes to show you part of the problem. This goes to show you what's the issue underlying here with these two types of repentance. Right? It's great to repent and turn away from evil and quickly return to what's good. But then there's other people who, right, instead of standing firm on what's good, they're all over the place. One minute they're good, but in the next choice they're bad. And then the next one they come back and they're good. And then they're back to bad. And this is what you're seeing with the children of Israel in the wilderness. The problem is, is that they're not being faithful. See, having full faith is to stay that course. Right? They made a commitment. They've even had moments of faith. Right? But they're not faithful. Faithful is a different story. You might... You might get in a marriage. You might you might love that person. You might say, I do. And then, you know, two years later, the guy's running off with his secretary. He made a commitment. He even had many moments of faith. But he wasn't faithful, right? He wasn't faith, didn't have faith in every testing. Eventually, his faith diminished. And so... It's one thing to have faith, it's another to be faithful. Messiah was faithful all the way unto death. It didn't matter what kind of troubles came, what kind of problems there were. At the end of the day, he was willing to accept whatever he had to accept, whatever punishment or trouble or difficulty he had to go through because he was going to remain faithful. So this is, this is kind of a key thing that we're going to see with Israel 
in this parasha is we're going to see how they're constantly wavering. They're constantly variable. They're going from good to evil, from faith to lack of faith and disbelief. And this is part of their problem. And what they really need to do along this journey is be faithful because when you're on a journey, you know, you can't start driving down the road and go most of the way down the road to get to your destination and then veer off, right? You can't repent and, and start driving, turning around, doing a U-turn and going back the other way. And then you get down there and you start going bad for a while and then you repent and you get back going to good and you're back on track and now you're heading back there, but then you repent. And this is why... When you look at this idea, which is going to be coming up pretty soon, about the 40 years in the wilderness, right? That's going to match this opening verse when he says he didn't bring them straight through to the through the land of the Palestine because they might see war and repent and turn back. So they're going around and around. They need time to develop the type of strength that it takes to be faithful, to be able to get all the way to the finish line. Because if you keep sabotaging yourself, you keep taking two step forward, one step back, one step forward, two steps back, then you're getting nowhere. You have to put a string of victories together. And that's what Messiah did. Messiah was faithful. And that was one of the greatest things about him. Is that he, no matter what came at him. See, the children of Israel, they get thirsty all of a sudden. They start becoming rebellious. They start complaining to God. They get hungry. Then even when they have miraculous water, right? Enough for millions of people. Miraculous food, enough for millions of people out in the wilderness, right? That should have been like awesome. You know what? Every day they didn't have to plant anything. They didn't do anything. Food just showed up on the ground. Water came out of rocks to give them something to drink. Food just appeared on the ground for them to eat. Like, that's pretty good because it's a serious problem if you don't have water or food for millions of people out in the wilderness. They had this. Every day it was delivered to them without any work or toil on their part. They didn't dig a well. They didn't plant crops and, and water them and wait for them to grow. Everything was given to them. And yet they still complained, right? And that goes back to the same saying that, you know, when you've eaten and you're full, then you'll forget me. So then they're complaining about meat. And it's like, well, okay, then they can get meat. What's the next thing they're going to complain about? You know? Then they're going to complain about Moshe. They're going to constantly complain. They're going to constantly want this. Did they get this stuff when they were over in Mitzrayim? Did Paro just produce bread for them? Did he provide everything, or do you think that they had to work for everything that they had there as slaves? Probably they had to work for everything that they had, on top of the other work that they did, if they wanted to survive. So the fact is, is they've got it all. Now we're learning the difference between a commitment, which is easy. It's easy to make a commitment. It's a little harder to have faith, and it's even harder, way harder, to remain faithful through difficult times. And this is part of the lesson that we're going to learn. The last part is when your arms get tired. we got a picture here of Moshe, right? And his arms being raised up. And, you know, we, we have, we have this, uh, this idea that when his arms are up, you know, then they would prevail in the war. The problem was your arms get tired. You might get tired of standing. You, your, your shoulders, right, which is where we carry the, carry the burdens, right? That's what they're known for. That's what's keeping his arms up. They get tired. They get weak. But what's he have? He has his support, his friends, who will hold up his arms. Because at the end of the day, you still got to do it even when it's difficult. It would be easy to just lift up the arms one time and say, okay, cool, that's good for everything. But it isn't. It's this ongoing thing. And that's the same thing when we see in Christianity. You know, they'll say a sinner's prayer. You know, they'll raise their arms up once. They'll humble themselves realize, hey, 
what I'm doing is wrong, and they'll raise their arms up once, and then they want to be one and done. But that's just not the way it goes. That's a commitment, but that's not faithfulness. Right? And then to make a commitment and then turn away from what's good and righteous, which is obeying the law, and going back to, to being a breaker of the law, then that commitment ends up not meaning anything. And that's the key. You want your commitment to be backed up with faith. And you want your faith to endure into faithfulness. This is the problem. This isn't easy. This is ongoing. You're going to get tired. Your shoulders are going to burn. The burden is sometimes going to be very difficult. You may lose your job because you want to observe the Sabbath. I've seen people before, oh, well, you know, it's easy when, you know, their boss didn't care. They were going to let them off on the Sabbath. But when their boss calls up and says, hey, we need you to work on the Sabbath, and then they're going, oh, well, you know what? God wouldn't want me to lose this job. Right? Wouldn't want me to have to struggle. Wouldn't want my arms to burn. So surely he didn't mean I had to hold my arms up. Yeah, sometimes you got to hold your arms up. Sometimes it's going to burn. Sometimes it's going to hurt to obey God. Do you think Avraham, when he was told to sacrifice Yitzhak, thought, hey, that's such an easy thing, no problem? Or do you think that was a very difficult thing? You see, there's many times, you know, many people who <coughs> have died and suffered greatly in order to do God's will, in order to obey God's commandments. And so don't just assume that, you know, we'll just do it when it's easy. Because there's work involved. There's effort that's involved. There's going to be scary times. And you don't want to be that kind of follower that is, you know what, when we see war, you know, we're going to turn around and we're going to go back away from God. You know, when it gets difficult, when it's just so much easier to not eat kosher or to not worry about the Shabbat. I've seen people, I've seen Messianics come and go. I've seen them come in and they were all zealous and then they get to the point they're not keeping the Shabbat. They're not really eating kosher anymore. And they just slip back into the ways of the world because it's so easy. And it's so, look, you know, it's it's just like homeschooling your kids. That ain't easy. Being responsible is not easy. Being responsible for others, that's not easy. Being accountable for results, it's not easy. It takes more time. You still have all the work that everybody else does. Plus now you're teaching your children where before you were just shipping them off to let somebody else do that and so you had you know me and my my wife were talking about this the other day there's you know the stay at home moms who are stay at home mom, moms <coughs> yet they still send their kids off to school like I could see if they were trying to have two incomes. But if you're not doing anything and you still don't want to raise your kids, that doesn't make any sense to me. It's hard. And it's even harder for others. <clears throat> it's hard when people were used to having two incomes and they got to go down to one income and then they're going to homeschool their kids. And that part's not easy either because now a mom's taking care of all the kids taking care of the house, doing all the same work that she would normally do. But on top of that, she's also having to be a teacher to every one of the kids and make sure that they're learning. You know, it's, it's, it's no different than anything else. When you make a commitment, yeah, you might not get that job because they want you to work on the Shabbat. Too bad. You have a harder time finding a job? Maybe too bad. Oh, you might have to lose your job. Too bad. Then it's not the right job for you. God can provide for you. It's the same way. It's like saying, well, I don't want to leave Mitzrayim because we're going out into the wilderness. But what if there's no water there? Look, if God brings you out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, he can also provide you water. He's not going to bring you out there to die. You know, but you will be tested. You will get thirsty. <clears throat> as, as it says in the scriptures, it says he humbled them 
with thirst, right? And hunger and all of this in the wilderness. It says to see if they would obey his law or not. It didn't say your belly will never be hungry. Your tongue will never thirst. It's going to thirst. And that's going to be a test. Your arms are going to get tired. And that's going to be a test. But what's the outcome? What's the final outcome? Did you keep your arms up? Even if it meant you had to have people holding up your arms. Because you were told to raise up your arms. So that Israel would prevail. That's the kind of commitment and the faithfulness that is required. Get all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed this message. Hope it was a blessing for you. Thanks for spending some time with me. Um, if you like the video, leave leave a like, uh, share it, whatever. Uh, comment. Love to hear your comments on it. Hope it was encouraging and yet challenging to you. And until next time, I'm going to say shalom.